He studied the date and the man carefully, his mind racing. The card was an odd item in itself. It proclaimed to be a driving licence, issued by the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency, however the inspector had never seen anything like it. It certainly looked nothing like his own driving licence, and it had unrecognisable insignias that reflected the light in strange ways. He also considered the other items he had removed from the body, and concealed in his case, and wondered to himself if, somehow, the date could be true. If it was, then the man, who looked about thirty, has found his way here from approximately ninety years in the future. The inspector replaced the licence in the wallet, and then put the wallet in a bag, and put this in his briefcase. He decided to make sense of it later, when time wasn't so sparse. He took a few more pictures of the body before turning the camera's attention to the surrounding trees. He decided to probe an earlier line of inquiry. So how did you find your way in here? We nearly missed it in the day. I imagine it would have been next to impossible during the night. He continued to point and click the camera at the trees, and as he did, the distant sound of branches snapping and scraping on metal announced somebody's imminent arrival. Perhaps ask me again later, Drew suggested, as the ambulance crept precariously through the trees and onto the mud, pulling up next to Frank's car. The mud was dry on the surface, but still sticky underneath, and the driver carefully manoeuvred the ambulance around and reversed it across the mud toward the stricken police car. Its thicker tyres were better equipped to travel across the brown goop, but the driver wisely stopped halfway to prevent himself coming stuck. The two ambulances men then climbed out with Sergeant Banks. Morning, gentlemen. The elder of the two ambulance men carefully approached Drew and the inspector, while Banks made his way back up to Frank. I'm looking for an inspector down from London, the ambulance man called to them. The other, much younger lad from the ambulance opened the back of the vehicle and started removing the stretcher. Yes, good morning, that would be me. The inspector held out his hand and the man shook it. Hello there, I'm Andy. Do you know where we're taking the body? Well, I hope you're taking it to the hospital in Netherwood, the inspector replied. Yes, that's it. The doctor there is very nice. Alan, his name is. Dr Collins. He can help you out when you get down there. Thanks for the tip, the inspector replied. The young assistant arrived with the trolley, which he forced awkwardly across the mud. The inspector could tell immediately that he had never seen a body before. He was ashen white, moved stiffly and avoided all eye contact. This is Jim. Jim, this is the inspector down from London. Hello, Jim. A body is nothing to be afraid of, and you won't have to be around it very long, the inspector reassured him. No, sir. Jim tried to swallow, but his mouth was as dry as his throat. This is Jim's first body, you see. Seen a fair few myself in a thirty year of work at the hospital, but you don't get many going like this. Usually they just goes from their beds where they died straight to the funeral home. Don't worry, Jim. He put a friendly arm around his young assistant. Come on, mate, best get it over with. He turned to the ins- he turned suddenly to the inspector. Presuming you're finished with it, Inspector. Yes, thank you, all finished. Do you mind if I take a few phot- photographs as you pick him up? Of course not, we don't mind, do we, Jim? Jim didn't look up, but shook his head. No need to be nervous, the inspector addressed the nervous Jim. It'll all be over before you know it, and you'll have a great story to show off with to your mates down the pub later. A smile crept into the corner of Jim's mouth. Either it was from the unexpected frankness from the inspector, or the truth in his words the inspector couldn't tell, but a little colour came back in his cheeks as he headed for the corpse. The inspector began taking pictures again. Drew simply stood and watched as the trolley was collapsed to the ground level and Andy arranged a black body bag on it for the body. The two men readied themselves to move the corpse towards the stretcher. Jim held the feet, Andy took the shoulders, and as they eased it from the ground, the torso lost contact with the earth and partially clotted blood disturbed in the wound escaped and oozed out onto the mud like partially set jelly. Oh! Jim exclaimed involuntarily, though he wasn't disheartened. Come on, lad, stay focused, Andy reminded him professionally. The body was lain carefully in the bag, which was quickly zipped up. The stretcher then deftly converted back into a trolley again, and the two men dragged and lifted it as best they could over the crusting mud. We'll be on our way then. Like I said, Inspector, Dr Collins at the morgue when you want to see it. Actually, a colleague of mine may get there before I do to perform the autopsy. Could you ask Dr Collins to offer every hospitality? I should get there sometime tomorrow afternoon to allow them time to work. I'll warn Dr Collins, no problem. Nice meeting you. He nodded at the inspector. Constable, he nodded at Drew. They secured the body inside the ambulance, climbed back in and carefully drove back through the trees. The wheels staggered and struggled through the mud, 
leaving four deep trenches in their wake, but the weight of the ambulance and the stoutness of its wheels saw it out safely. The inspector took some photographs of the trenches before putting the camera away in his case and removing the tape measure again. Would you mind holding this? The inspector handed Drew the end of the tape. And standing here, he took him by the shoulders and positioned him next to the body shape painted out onto the bloodied mud. I'm going to take a few measurements. Back in a minute. Please follow me as I move around, but try to stay in the same place as best you can. The inspector then took the metal disc containing the tape and began carefully walking over the mud, trying not to slip. As he did, the tape unwound with a whir that filled the area as the three policemen watched the inspector from London beginning his inspecting. After a trying walk, the inspector reached the edge of the trees and checked the distance between the body and the outside edge. 33 feet. He wrote this down on his notebook, then reached into his briefcase and removed a small compass. He angled it and found the north, and then began drawing a map of the clearing, the position of the body in it and the angle it laid in. He walked around the edge of the trees, checking the tape and the compass, reading in between, keeping his balance on the uneven, slippery surface. He made his way cautiously around the full circumference, noting any deviance in the circle's edge. The body lay facing east to west, head to east, toward Nettlewood. The clearing was roughly circular, approximately 200 feet in circumference, the fatal wound appearing to be at the approximate centre. There was no growth inside the crater. He had added a northerly pointing arrow to his map for reference and also estimated the position on the map of the car, the opening and the paths of all the vehicles across the mud. He then placed the compass in his bag and removed a small battery-powered machine which he switched on using a button on the side. A dim green light began to glow to show that it was on and working. He pulled from its top a long aerial and as he did so, the green light shone a little brighter. As he moved around the muddy area, he angled the area in different directions, and as he did so, it emitted clicking noises, which rose and fell in frequency depending on what angle he aimed the aerial. With each change in the noises from the machine, the inspector filled his notebook with scribbles and marked numbers on his hand-drawn map. He constantly referred to the tape measure to give a distance on the map to relation to the centre. Once he had navigated around the area, he switched the machine off again, then brought out a box with a metal rod attached by a curled wire like one might find on a telephone. The machine did not emit any noises, nor did it have a green light, but it did have a small dial on the front which he studied. The dial ranged from green on the left to red on the right, with a needle to give it a reading. For now, the needle pointed toward the green area on the left. The inspector once again began walking around the area, following unseen paths the instrument guided him along. All readings were the dial deviated from its position were scribbled down and marked on the map. He traipsed this way and that, from the crater's edge to the body and back again. He stopped at the edge of the crater and looked at the trees. Anything that lurked between them was hidden by the darkness of their trunks. Their numbers blocked any chance of a view inside further than a few yards, and they were silent as if standing guard, hiding in an inner world. As the breeze tossed the high branches around, shadows danced in contorted shapes on the trunks, giving the trees movement to bring them to life. He wondered what Drew had seen in them that could have led him into here. He put the machine away and retrieved his camera. He took pictures as best he could of the inner copse as he wandered around the edge one last time. He then traipsed across the mud towards Drew. He checked the ground constantly as he had on his way around the area. He was not only searching the ground for a safe path, his eyes examined every inch for a sign of entry, a clue as to how the body managed to appear here. He saw none. The only prints were of his and Drew's. There was not even a bird's footprint to suggest any other living thing had been here. All done, Drew asked hopefully. He didn't mention the search he had just witnessed, the bizarre instruments or the noises they had made. Yes, sorry for keeping you. The inspector could see how weary he must be feeling and regretted having to delay Drew from getting to his bed. He took the end of the tape from Drew and placed it back in his briefcase. He knew that every detail could be vital and had to be recorded as soon after the event as possible. You're a very thorough inspector, Drew pointed out, though I am a little unsure what you are being thorough about. One must be thorough to remain close to the facts, the inspector replied. The first few hours are the most important in collecting evidence. We can go now, Drew. If you try to get the car started, I'll fetch Sergeant Gates and ask him to try and pull you out. 
The inspector began to walk up to where Frank leant against his car, waiting. Banks stood a few feet away. Both had been watching the two men closely the whole time. Drew turned, still not entirely clear about what kind of evidence the inspector had been searching for. He obediently walked back to his car, climbed into the driver's seat and pessimistically turned the key. The engine had been sat in cold mud all night, so Drew was not surprised, but a little disheartened to hear the slow chug that the engine made as it tried to start. He put his foot on the accelerator and tried again, keeping the key fully turned. The engine turned over several times but refused to start, then suddenly it spluttered. The chug became a rapid series of barks, and with a blast of revs the car came to life, breathing out a thick black cloud of acrid smoke in the process. Drew kept the revs high, allowing the engine time to become used to the idea of being awake before trying to get it to move. "'Everything all right down there?' Frank asked as the inspector approached. "'Yes, all fine, thank you.' "'How long does the paint last?' Frank asked as it started to spit with rain. A blackening sky raced overhead. "'Long enough,' the inspector replied. "'We are all done now, so I thought I'd best come and ask you to pull his car out.' "'Certainly. Sounds like Drew's managed to start it. I thought it was dead.' He checked himself. If you'll pardon the expression, he nodded down the hill to where the body had been. All that rain now was a thin line of paint on the red earth where the blood had soaked into the ground. He turned away in embarrassment and went to fetch the tow rope from the boot of his car. He returned, walking a few feet past the inspector and called to Drew. Give it a go now, lad. Drew put the car in reverse and Banks, Frank, and the inspector all watched with interest to see what luck he would have of getting it out of the mud. The car's engine strained. The chassis tried to move, but the wheel strained, firmly glued to the spot like the hooves of a stubborn goat. Drew tried again, with more revs, forcing the tyres round as carefully as he could. Slowly they forced him out of the mud and onto the surface. The car managed to creep backwards a few feet before the tyres suddenly broke through the thin crust and the front wheels began to spin in the mud. The three men watched in awkward anticipation, as it was obvious he would become stuck again at some point, and they wondered if this was it. Drew put the car into first, and rocked it forwards and backwards a little to clear some space. He then attempted to pull forward to release the car wheels, but was unsuccessful. The engine gave out under the strain, sputtered and died, and a resigned Drew climbed out of the car again. Good effort, young man, the inspector surprised all of the local force by calling out. Thank you, inspector. I don't think it's going to go any further without all help, though, Drew called back. Frank began carefully testing the ground between his cars and Drew's with a foot. I reckon I could get my car up to here. He stood about four feet away from Drew's car bumper. Tow rope's pretty long. We might get you up before breakfast. He passed the rope to the inspector and then climbed into his car. With the inspector's direction, he moved his car as close as he thought possible, guided by the burly man's cautious waving and careful examination of the ground. Frank stopped his car when he was as close as he could get, and the inspector bent down to examine the rear of Drew's car. The loop of the metal for the tow rope was covered in mud and difficult to reach, but with a little effort he deftly tied two half hitches, and when he had safely attached the other end to Frank's car, he signalled that the line was secure. Both policemen then started their engines and the inspector took a retreat back from the cars as quickly as he could. As Frank pulled forward, the tow rope lost its slack, became taut, then was stretched and thinned as if to snap before the wheels on Drew's car gave against the gloopy brown sea. The wheels on Frank's car span, spraying mud a considerable distance into the air. It did not spray quite far enough to reach the inspector, who watched with a bemused smile. Slowly the two cars made it clear of the worst and Drew's wheels gained a grip on the drier mud. When he had reversed out of the worst and up the hill to safety, the inspector then returned to the cars and untied the rope while the two drivers climbed out of their seats and shook hands in congratulations. The inspector approached and Banks chose this moment to join them. Well, now we have the car out, I can drive you home while Frank and the inspector go to the hospital with the body. Banks barked orders rudely. Almost right, Sergeant, the inspector interjected. Drew, you can go home now. Get some sleep and we can talk again when you wake up. Yes, sir, Drew replied wearily. He felt as if the games between him and Banks might be over now. The inspector's arrival had changed everything. It's Inspector. You can just call me Inspector. Call me at Nettlewood Station when you've rested. See you in a few hours. Drew simply nodded, climbed back into his muddied car and drove away. 
The inspector then turned to Banks. Sergeant Gates will give you a lift back to your car. Then please return to your station. I am sure there are matters in your constabulary that need to be pertained to. We will speak again later. Yes, Inspector. Banks' jaws was locked and he spoke through grinding teeth. The other two men followed him and climbed in. Sergeant Gates, if you would be good enough, would you mind driving me to the Swan and Dove in Nettlewood, where I will be staying? The inspector asked as he pulled his seatbelt on. Banks reeled in surprise at this, but it made sense to Frank almost immediately. Presumably the murderer was someone in, in the town, so for the inspector to stay close by seemed logical. It's very nice at the Swan and Dove, Frank remarked, revelling in the inspector's casual air of, of authority over Banks. Is it? the inspector replied, intrigued. Yes, a friend of mine stayed there. Very welcoming, he said. I am glad. The inspector liked rural police forces. The matters that concerned them were serious enough for the location, but generally speaking, in the grand scheme of things, nothing of any real gravity took place. The freedom from such harsh realities as might be trivial in larger cities allowed the local forces time to appreciate a deeper knowledge of their area, the people and places in it, and they earned the respect of the people because of it. Towns like this were not supposed to have dead bodies appear in them, and the inspector wanted life to return to normal for these people as soon as possible. So, you're not just going to collect the body and go? asked Banks, incapable of grasping the situation. No, Sergeant, I am here to investigate its discovery in the cops and ascertain the reason for it to have appeared there. I will be here as long as it takes. But you're not staying in Firestone Cops? Banks asked. No, I am staying in Nettlewood, the inspector repeated, much to Banks's relief. Frank drove them down the thin path, which showed no signs of relenting under the barrage of the cars. At the road, Banks went to climb out. I'll be reached at Nettlewood Police Station for now. Should you need me, the inspector told him, his authoritative tone stopping Banks in his tracks. Yes, inspector, Banks replied, shooting Frank a look of unhidden animosity. And I will need to talk to you once I've settled myself in the hotel, so please remain at Firestone Station. Banks turned an angry red. Yes, Inspector, he replied through his teeth. The inspector ignored his hostility and allowed him to climb out of the car. Sergeant Gates, could you spare a few men to come down and comb the area? They will need to go over every inch with great care so as to discover any evidence that we may have left behind. The inspector asked. Yes, Inspector, I'll come back down here later with a few men and scour the place, he assured them. They pulled out onto the road and headed back to Nettlewood. The sound of the car engine slowly faded as the men drove away, leaving the area with the crater empty of all movement, save for the occasional stray leaf caught in the wind. The stillness remained. The dip in the ground continued collecting rain, but otherwise it was empty. When they were sure everyone had gone, the trees began whispering to each other. Chapter 5 at the exit from the wood onto the road, Drew turned left. He drove the car's tyres through every puddle he could see to try and shake the mud out of their tread. The wet roads were slippery, and the going was slow at first. He didn't check his mirrors. The thought of seeing those lights again filled him with dread. He drove carefully, aware of his lack of sleep. The journey was quiet, and he unwittingly checked his mirrors out of habit. Driving close behind was Banks in his squad car. Drew ignored his closeness to the car's bumper and concentrated on his driving, and soon houses began appearing along the roadside. Amongst the trees, car cars could be seen in driveways. Soon brick buildings un outnumbered trunks, and Drew was back in Firestone. He took a left toward the western outskirts of the town and saw banks speed away along the northern road toward the station. Drew was exhausted, cold, and soaked to the skin despite his waterproofs. He pulled the car up outside his house and traversed it carefully into the drive. He left it at an angle, further away from the door than usual, but safely parked, and let himself in. He placed his keys back on the table and trudged wearily up to the bathroom and started running a bath. He stripped in his bedroom, every movement causing his pain, every muscle crying for rest. By the time he had his clothes off, a hot tub of foamy water awaited him. He turned the taps off and climbed straight in, laying his head back. He took a long sigh and allowed himself to relax. His eyes closed, and there facing him again were the eyes, alone in the blackness behind his eyelids. 
He was too relaxed and too tired to open them, so he stared them out, searching for a meaning. As he stared, the road came into focus around them, and he drifted into a dream where he relived the previous light. He watched a car reversing towards him, battered and tossed by the storm. He began moving away from it as it approached through the trees. The car stopped, paused and turned up the path into the trees, following him. When he had reached the clearing, he stayed in the trees and watched the car drive down into the crater. Looking through the branches were other eyes, all watching the car, all watching Drew. The light passed through the branches, illuminated through the wood, staring, watching him discover the body. Drew woke with a start. The water had gone cold and the dream filled his mind, the eyes in the wood watching him, the reversal of perspective. He pulled the plug and sat in the bath as the water drained away, rubbing his head and eyes. He toweled himself dry, pulled his pyjamas on and climbed thankfully into bed. He put the dream down to being just that, a dream, and tried to forget it. Now he was home, bathed and in his own bed, he felt like the previous evening was a million miles away. It had happened to someone else, not him. He took a bottle of aspirin out of his bedside drawer and took two tablets, then sat in bed and drank half a glass of water before settling down under the duvet. He closed his eyes and there were the eyes waiting for him again, and once again he began to relive the previous night as he delved into a restless sleep. Chapter 6 A voice battled against the darkness. The void it inhabited dropping and weaving giddily about it. It took all its effort to conceive a world outside as it flashed past. The voice struggled to form a picture of the world, struggling with new perceptions. It tried to gauge a meaning from what little flashed past it in the dark, like shadows cast across a wall through a window it couldn't see. It knew where it was. It had been contained inside this one, and others like it, for longer than it wanted to be. This existence was not what it had planned but better than the alternative, oblivion. But only just. Here it was trapped until a way out could be found. It had waited a long time and had almost given up any hope. The prisons were temporary, weak, thought bound to matter. When all escape had become blocked, it, something had begun to make things feel different. Circumstances had conspired. Others like it were, it discovered, forming ways to try and help and had been for all its incarcerated hell. This time, though, something was different. The fear was back, and through the window it sensed the cause. Another person, another echo of thought encased in flesh that threatened to reveal all. Is it time? the voice screamed, disembodied, trapped, possessed. It wondered if its captor heard. It wondered if its captor would reply, or even if it could hear. No, came a booming reply and the voice cowered lower, fearful, writhing with the pain and the effort it took. How long had the reply taken? Moments? Eons? Such entrapment kept it lonely and desperate. I will stop it again. The captor's voice boomed across the expanse of darkness. No form, no source. The voice sank back into desperation. Its prison, this living tomb, had been responsible for its trap and had prevented escape in the past. We've done it for 300 years, we can do it for 300 more. Not this time, you can't hide it this time. With power it didn't know it had, the voice shouted its bravest reply. It took consolation from its bravery, it felt a return of energy, of its own purpose. A deep, mocking laugh returned, echoing, overpowering, and almost ridding the voice of the grain of hope it found. The voice returned to its silence, reserved its energy, and began to plan its escape. Chapter 7 Banks tore his attention away from his reflection in the mirror. He swore constantly under his breath, muttering obscenities at the intrusion onto his patch and at the unwelcomed visitor. He left the inspector and Frank at the wood, and had soon caught up with Drew, quickly becoming agitated at him for not driving faster. Damn him, you'd have thought he would want to get home quicker, he swore to himself out loud. He was angry at the inspector for embarrassing him in front of Frank. How dare he come into my town and talk to me like that, he hissed at an invisible occupant. At least he's not coming here, he reassured himself. They entered the town, and Drew turned left towards his house. A hint of paranoia crept into Banks' mind. I wonder what they were talking about in that mud, he muttered. He had watched them carefully, but had been unable to gauge their conversation. 
They could have been talking about him. Drew, he thought, could have been going back to Nettlestone to talk to the inspector. Perhaps he was driving to Firestone as a distraction to stop him from becoming suspicious. He took the next left away from the route to the police station and towards Drew's house. He drove quickly, having to make up the distance along the longer route. When he arrived, it appeared his suspicions were correct. Drew's car was not there. He stopped behind the van of Jenkins, the window cleaner, close enough to see the empty drive, but far enough away to remain unnoticed. He sat frowning and trying to think what his next move should be. Would the inspector call the station to talk to him? How long did he have before he was missed? He frowned a little harder and stared at the empty drive outside Drew's house. The sound of a car's engine droned up the road towards him, and on sight of it he breathed a sigh of relief. Drew pulled into his drive, locked his car, and went straight into the house. Banks waited, watching the windows. He knew this house. He knew the ba bathroom and bedroom windows could both be seen from where he had parked. The bathroom a small rectangle on the side, and the bedroom a large window at the front. Both went on and stayed on. Drew was home now. It was safe for him to leave, but suddenly more doubt crowded in on his mind. What if, he thought, Drew had seen him as he went into the house? What if he was waiting for him to go so he could make his way back to the inspector? He gripped the steering wheel, frustrated at the unknown, battling with himself for not knowing if he was worrying unnecessarily or if his paranoia were justified. He could wait no longer. He knew Drew was home. That was enough. He performed a quick three-point turn in the road and drove back the way he had come, this time heading for the police station.